So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September the 23rd, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 176. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So I'm really glad that you're here with me today. And summer's gone. That's right, we're into autumn. I think this is the second day of autumn or fall or whatever they want to call it. It's getting colder. How cold is it, you might ask? Well, it's 52 degrees Fahrenheit outside right this minute, which is 11 degrees Celsius. What's the relative humidity? Well, 71% relative humidity, so not bad for dehydrating that last bit of honey, and that's what they're doing right now. So it's getting colder. Tomorrow, actually, if you're in my neck of the woods, it's going to be the best day to get out there and mess with your bees. Today is not the day to do it. Too cold. So if you're trying to take honey off and stuff like that on a day like today, Good luck, because when the weather's really cold, the propolis is tougher to get through. And uh, most of the bees are going to be in the hives, so you're going to deal with more bees. And uh, it's just, it works against you. Do it on a hotter day. You're going to want to watch the fluff section at the very end today, because I have a lot to talk about. Which is timely. It has to do with what's going on right now in your backyard. So if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and you'll see the topics in order. And many thanks to Adam Holmes, who every single Q&A Friday itemizes those. And you'll see the pinned comment, and he puts the timestamp next to every one. So you can avoid wasting a bunch of your time watching the video on things that you already know everything about. So the questions that we're going over were submitted over the past week, and people write them on uh, YouTubes that they look at. They also post their comments via thewaytobe.org. And when you get to that website, you look down that left column and you see the page marked the way to be and on that page is a form for you to fill out see so you don't have to give up all your information i don't need to know your email your real name or anything else you can call yourself anything you want on there and submit your questions that way so what else should we talk about uh we're out of time you know for a lot of stuff and so most of these questions are related to end of the season things to do with your bees in your backyard. So let's get started. The first one comes from Candace Dainty, and that is her YouTube channel name. And I checked out the YouTube channel, by the way. It's I think there's two videos of her husband playing the drums, which was pretty fun to look at. Anyway, it says here, I've had two bad months here. I hurt my leg, my hip. The action is equivalent to disjointing a chicken thigh. Ouch. I could not walk for a week and still have issues. Then, two weeks ago, my blessed 85-year-old husband and helper fell off a nasty three-step stair into his garage. So he broke his hip and he required hip replacement surgery. That's a lot of tough stuff going on. This is all going on while our next-door neighbor is building more solar panels on an adjacent building 20 feet from my hives. My most active hive is now... Silent with two exclamation points. I'm considering that hive to be history. I do have QMP from Better Bee. I wonder if that could help. I also have two deep boxes to add and insert syrup, then the fleece on top. Any suggestions you can give me are most welcome. I don't want to lose my bees, although I may already have lost that hive. But the thing I wanted to address on this entire scenario, but first of all, I hope that you're healing fast. I hope your husband gets back online quick. And uh, just a terrible time, any time of year to get injured is bad. But at the end of the year, when the weather's transitioning and it's getting colder outside and we have all the heavy lifting yet to do, it's hard, harder when you have injuries. So I hope there are friends that can help you out and I wish you a speedy recovery and your husband. Nice, nice drum uh, video, by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it, check it out. But the QMP, Q QMP stands for Queen Mandibular Pheromone, Better B sells it. I think there are other sources for it, but it's a synthetic pheromone that imitates a queen. So in other words, would it be useful in this instance? Probably not. If you've lost your bees, you've lost your bees. If you don't have a queen this time of year, your only solution this late in the year for the Northeastern United States, and if you're lucky enough to be in the Southern Hemisphere, you have lots of time ahead of you. So for those of you who are watching from Australia, Good for you. You have all the time in the world and things are warming up instead of cooling down. So you could still wait for your bees to replace their losses with a new queen if there are eggs and resources available to do it. You have time. 
So for us up here in the north, uh, time has run out. So now you can actually go and buy a new queen, fly a mated queen, get that replaced. That's a couple of questions about that. And uh, I actually bought two queens last week for, actually I bought three, but I used two. One I gave to one of the people that I'm mentoring, so, because they were queenless. And uh, there just isn't time to let them make a whole new queen. Plus, these had no resources. In other words, there were no eggs, there were no open larvae and things like that. Uh, so the reason that you could use QMP, the synthetic pheromone, would be as a placeholder. You put that in the hive and it makes them believe that there's a queen present. Therefore, they don't take the steps that they otherwise would to make a replacement queen. But let's say all the eggs are gone and they couldn't make a replacement queen anyway. Would that be a waste of time to use that QMP in there? It comes in the form of a little noodle. There's two in a pack, dirt cheap, $5 and something for the package. You put them in the freezer. They last a very long time. So then you could put one of those in there while you wait to catch a swarm or something else to keep them from turning into laying workers. Laying workers can happen three weeks or more after the absence of a queen. So that's what that's for. It's really not a tool for getting bees when you don't have bees. Uh, I'm doing a lot of fooling around with it, but nothing is definitive and I definitely wouldn't count on it for that. So this late in the year, if you've got a colony of bees that still has numbers that could survive winter, they just happen to be queenless, this is the time to get a hold of a mated queen. So if you've got somebody that's got a great reputation that's local to you, that uh, has a surplus of mated queens, some people are probably offering discounts on those right now. And if you don't have any of that available, you can still get them through the mail. So I got mine through the mail from... Um, I was about to say Better Bee, but I did not get it from Better Bee. Bee Weaver, of course, in Sarasota, Texas. So I got them from Bee Weaver. Beautiful queens. They were marked and everything, and they shipped them straight to me, and they came within 48 hours. So it's pretty sweet. They were very vigorous when we got them. So those are installed and immediate differences in the colonies. By the way, as soon as you put a queen in a queenless colony, it's fun to see them. So that's kind of what you have left to do. So those, that's my suggestion for you. QMP, nope. The whole purpose is a placeholder. If you've lost your queen and have no opportunity to recover, then uh, that ship has sailed. You really have to get a queen in there. Or you can combine them. So if you've got a colony that's queenless, you can combine them with another colony that has a queen. And the weaker colony goes on top of the stronger colony. And yes, you will lose some foragers when you do that because they will go back to the old location. So that's my advice on that. Question number two comes from Trish in Somerset, South Dakota. Hi, Fred. We're in western South Dakota and get very cold winters with lots of snow and below zero temps. This will be our first winter with bees. At the bee meeting, it was suggested to pack down our hives which I understood to put all the brood from the two double deeps into the bottom box. And can you explain packing down a hive, please? Thank you. So I think it's, by the way, when you're at a bee meeting and they bring up a topic like that, that's a great time to hang out after the meeting and loiter and visit with people who are doing the packing down and get all your questions answered. Don't leave until you get your questions answered. But I'm happy to talk about it too. I'm going to try. I always make these promises that I'll make a topic specific video that will show the packing down process. But then you know I get these narrow windows of opportunity when the weather's perfect and it's 2 p.m. and I have to take pictures at 5 or something like that and I don't uh, make a video. I just run out there and do it. So here's the packing down process. I don't really need a, a hive to do it to show it. But when you're looking at your beehives at this time of year, because hopefully the queen is starting to slow down her production, so it's natural to see your brood pattern on the frames shrinking when you go to do an inspection. Hopefully you can do this at the same time that you pull apart your beehives when you're harvesting any honey at the end of the year. So that's also it for those of you who are always curious what's the latest we should take honey off. It depends on how much honey is on the hive and how much you have to leave based on your region for the bees to survive winter. But I did that this past week, and that's why I discovered I kind of knew it wasn't a big surprise because the landing board was uh, had very low activity. I'm a pollen counter, so when I see the pollen not going into a hive, I know we, we have troubles. So also, I pulled those off. I had one that was going to be my fantastic Ross Round Comb Honey Super. Not a single 
Ra's round was being drawn out. Oh, queenless colony. Yay. So anyway, uh, so packing down on that one involves pulling off all the partially filled supers that are on top of the hive. So as a minimum, I want to leave on a single deep box. And that's for brood. That's all my bottom boxes are deeps. And then the next box up is the medium super, but that's for the bees. So in other words, in the springtime, turned out to be a wise move this year, by the way, I don't do anything until they fill that second box and start capping the honey. So seven out of 10 frames would be full and capped before I super that hive again. And then above that, that becomes surplus honey that we could be taking off, you know, whenever things get really full in your beehive. So the other thing is we know that they're they're finishing off their honey because we don't smell it in the air as much as we just did. So again, cooler days and everything else. So what I look for are partial boxes of honey. Anything that's a partial gets pulled, unless it's all they have. But here's the concern. Uh, when you have a partial frame, a partial box of honey, make sure that the honey that's there is centered. And the reason for that is your bees are going to rise up into that uh, super during winter time. So if the, if the frames on the outer edges of the box are full and they're split apart from one another. So I'll give you a couple of options. So let's just talk about that. Let's make an assumption that your beehive and you're in the Northern hemisphere, that your landing board faces South or South by Southeast. So then when you're packing things down and your any partial frames get pulled first and you keep the full frames and you pack those down into your lower boxes. Now, if you're gonna have a partial box full of frames, where would you focus those? Where would the cluster of bees end up in the wintertime? Well, they start to migrate towards the eastern side of the box. So sunrise is where they're headed. And then southeast. So if you're packing down your frames, you can center them up or you can also push those right up against the eastern side. That's also why they naturally build up more comb on that side first because it's the first side of the hive that gets warmed in the morning time. So. Uh, it's very interesting. And what you're trying to do is reduce the amount of space that your bees have to police during winter, because keep in mind, their numbers inside the hive are going to go down. This is also why people are alarmed when they do Varroa destructor mite counts, that the mite counts seem to rapidly increase this time of year, while the numbers of the bees in the hive are decreasing because the queen isn't replacing them with the same amount of brood. What happens is you get a bunch of mites in there if you haven't been controlling your mites and you haven't been counting them. Now they're gonna mob the bees, specifically the nurse bees, but they'll go to any bee, any, any port in a storm, so to speak. And so your mite count numbers go up because there are more mites per bee because there are fewer bees for the mites to occupy to feed on. So these are alarming things that happen, but we don't want them to have all this extra space to deal with. And I have another question coming up today that we're going to talk about where there's too much honey and how that can also be a problem, which sounds counterintuitive, but it actually can work against your bees. So what you don't want to do is leave a whole bunch of uh, empty frames on your hive going into winter. And uh, when you're pulling your supers off, since you already did the work to get the super off, the bees are already packed down. Just don't put them back on the hive. So close it up, put your hopefully an insulated inner cover, hopefully you close down your vents on the top and uh, you have a feeder space above your insulated inner cover however that's made and a space to accommodate either dry sugar or some kind of fondant some kind of solid feed uh, for an emergency resource for carbohydrates for winter time and uh, that's pretty much it size your colony for the number of bees that you have i have an interesting situation. My observation hives, I only have three now, they are swarm generators, just based on the fact that they're small. So they have a very limited space. So what happens is the population builds up, they store the resources, and then once they're full and maxed out, what do they do? They create a new colony of bees. So they send out the existing queen and uh, they make a new queen from their queen cells that they produced before the old queen was sent away. And one of those is the smallest one. So it has, it has 12 medium frames in it on four levels. So they're all medium, stacked straight up in groups of three. Groups of three at an observation hive is really good because that means that center frame, they've got bees on both sides of it, that center frame becomes your winter brood frame 
because they're insulated by honey and bees, and then there's the frame. But what's interesting about that colony is every single day I thought they were going to swarm because they're wall-to-wall -wall bees, huge beard on the outside. And uh, if you wanted non-swarming genetics, that colony is it. They're also the ones that are grooming constantly. Uh, so their numbers have stayed up all year, but guess what? They have six frames of fully capped honey, all medium frames. They're set for winter. So it's really interesting. Um, so when you have smaller numbers of bees in a bigger space, you got a problem. And you have to evaluate. So I couldn't pack down, for example, a small colony like that because they're wall-to-wall -wall bees. So if you're in, in your third box and every frame is covered with bees and you've got capped honey in there and resources and they have the numbers to support and sustain that, I would leave those alone. So I would go through one or three boxes. And uh, so packing down is getting rid of extra space, extra supers, your last straw if you don't put the box back on. And then of course you make uh, preparations so that you can later, when the weather gets cold, provision that hive with emergency resources if you need it. But I've not needed more than about 45 pounds of honey to get my bees through winter. So again, year after year, you'll figure out better how much to leave on. And I don't recommend leaving a huge surplus on. I think we're going to hit on that in another question. Moving on to question number three from Donald, who's in Oberlin, Ohio. First year beekeeper with two hives. I plan on wintering with one medium and one deep. That's the optimum configuration for me right here. I plan on pulling off honey supers around the 23rd of September. Okay, so that's coming right up. And in fact, if you're anywhere near where I am for Donald, 23rd of September, I recommend Saturday. Do it. It's going to be the hottest day. Best day for it. So the weather here looks finally like it's going to stop spiking in the 80s. I treat mainly with Formic Pro. So that's Formic Acid Treatment. My question is about a product called Super DFM that my local supplier pushes very hard as a must, which took me by surprise as I've never heard of the stuff. It says here, Super DFM is a probiotic for bees. Do you have any experience with this sort of thing? Any thoughts on it? I actually have lots of thoughts on it. <laughs> so DFM, for those of you who don't know, those are direct fed microbials. And there's a company, it's called Strong Microbials, and I believe they're in Wisconsin. And how do I know that? Well, because I interviewed um, one of their owners, one of the researchers, uh, Dr. Sokolov. Uh, so I'm gonna link that interview for those of you who wanna watch it, it's a YouTube. I've interviewed a lot, so a lot of bee experts and bee researchers, and that just happens to be one of them. And they created two products. So they created Super DFM, Direct Fed Microbials, uh, they were designed to help bees in agricultural areas, so the beginning formula was, so that bees that were having a negative impact from agricultural chemicals, so the pesticides that were being used in big ag were negatively impacting bees, and so this group, she and her husband are both researchers, um, they developed these direct fed microbials, and they help the bees mid-gut, they counter the negative impacts of this agricultural practice, these pesticides that are in use. And so great science behind it, lots of research has been done. So you can look into that. There's another group and another person that I also interviewed, which ties into this. And they have a product coming out too, which by the way, still don't have. It's called Best for Bees. And when I talked with her, and that's a Canadian company, and when they did Best for Bees, they have this entrance. And there's something called, we all know what a dispenser is. You go to a, you know, a candy machine or whatever, and it dispenses what you want. So there's the reverse of that, which is called inspensing. So instead of dispensing, we're inspensing. So the way this new hive entrance is configured uh, it has lots of options, but the main one was that it tied in immediately with the direct fed microbial group because I noticed that their method of delivering their microbes into the hive uh, was to puff it with air. And that didn't seem very efficient. So then when I was interviewing and talking about this inspensing system, I thought, wow, you guys should really get together because if we had this dry powder, 
And by the way, they mix it with rice in the examples that I saw. So the DFM goes in with the rice, the rice prevents it from clumping up. The bees going into the hive from the field. So the foragers are the ones that are exposed to these negative pesticides, right? So then when they go through, through the inspenser, they walk across the super DFM, they get it on their feet, they get it on their hair, and they track it into the hive. So they're actually using the bees to medicate the hives. And their early versions of that were the other way. So this is tied in with agricultural practices. They were trying to use the bees to dispense. So they would walk through something, get it on their bodies. And then when they flew to different flowers or different crops that they were pollinating, they would be putting uh, beneficial microbes on those crops. And then that would, of course, protect them from disease. So, or do things that were beneficial to the crops and then instead of, this was kind of clever stuff, way above my pay grade, by the way, so I'm giving you the layperson's view of it. If you wanted to dust your crops, because, for example, you want to get these protective materials to the flowers. So their method for doing that, of course, is to broadcast everything and cover the whole plant instead of just the flowers. So what were they doing? They were using a dispenser getting the bees to go through the treatment that they wanted on the plants. And then the bees were carrying it directly to what? The flowers. So it was very efficient and they used the bees to treat the plants. So that's the very kind of dumbed down version of it. And like I said, if you want to know more, or you want to get in touch, it's you look into Strong Microbials, go to their website, you can read all their research and stuff, or you can also watch my interview. But that's kind of what this is all about. Now here's the part. My question is about product called Super FM. My local supplier pushes very hard. Okay, do you need it? I don't know if you need it. Uh, personally, um, like for me right here, I have uh, agricultural practices going on. We have the soybeans right now. They rotate back and forth, soy and corn. And of course, these things are treated to protect themselves from disease and from insect attacks and things like that. So if, for example, my bees were showing negative impacts, I don't even have the means to evaluate the bees to know, are my bees not doing well because they're being exposed to pesticides? Now, pesticides, by the way, when you use that term, we think, you know, it kills insects. Insects are insecticides, specifically, but pesticides includes herbicides, fungicides, and things like that. They're designed to protect plants from pests. So your bees can actually have a sublethal exposure, sublethal dose of some herbicide of some kind. So I can't be specific about that, sorry. But uh, they can actually have a negative impact that you don't necessarily register. The numbers of bees that you have seem okay. Maybe they're just not producing as much honey as they otherwise would, or maybe they're not pollen gathering as effectively as they would. So if you have a long-standing understanding of what's going on in your neck of the woods with your bees and then you've kept records so you know that your colonies produce so much honey bring in so much nectar and of course you also in partnership with that information you gather weather information because all of this impacts your bees ability to fly to gather resources and of course to bolster their numbers and we look at the health and well-being of the colony inside the hive stronger bees can do more work so that's the premise of giving them direct fed microbials, which boosts the overall health and well-being of the bee so it can perform better for a longer period of time. Bees, for example, they get a sublethal dose from some kind of herbicide or some kind of pesticide that's being used near you. Uh, they just don't live as long. You wouldn't necessarily know that. So if you have a bee that should be living six weeks during peak performance, uh, and instead they're living three or four, then you would see a decline in productivity from the colony overall without necessarily knowing because you really, you know, the science behind that is exhaustive. In order for us to figure out the gains of that would be very hard. So then the other end of that is now we have to delve into microbiology and then you would have to get into the microbiome of the bee and then you would have to find out the activity of the mid gut of the bee and uh, if it's negatively impacted then it can't process its nutrients, its resources well. So anyway, I'm not going to go down a long list on that, but I would say if you get a local supplier that's pushing you really hard on something, you have to weigh the value to yourself. Now for me, I'm a 
backyard beekeeper. I'm small scale. And uh, it's because my product is bee knowledge. So I would be interested if I could quantify the results. So, I, you know, it's, it's you know, when somebody's really pushing something on you, I'd say, well, just shoot me the science on that. Show me some published papers. Let me do some reading and let me see if it's worthwhile. And if you find out it's designed and effective for some specific pesticide being used in your area, uh, then yeah, maybe it would work. But if that pesticide is being used 10 miles away from you, it would be of no benefit whatsoever because I have another saying too. A lot of people, I used to be a real fitness nut. I know, it's unbelievable, but true. I was what was called a fitness coordinator. I used to train a lot of guys in the military and I used to lead physical training and uh, we would run long distances, swim a thousand yards, do a lot of strength and stretch routines and things like that. And then some of the new kids would sneak in and they'd have these like Vita packs and all this stuff that they wanted to take. And uh, first of all, so we shut that down. You can't have any of that. Eat good food, be healthy, be fit, be capable. So that was always my premise. Because here's the thing, if you're healthy, you can't be like more healthy. If, if you're already healthy, if you're digestive system is working right and everything's working right. I can't take something else unless it's a performance enhancing drug, which is a totally different thing. And I don't go on board with any of that. But if you're healthy and capable, you're healthy and capable. You're doing what you're supposed to do. And if you bring in something else, Vitapax or whatever that make you urinate fluorescent colors, sorry for the graphics, but that's not good. See, it's not good for you. So if you're performing as you need to, then you don't need to bring anything else in. You don't need to add anything else. You want to rely on a normal diet that's available everywhere. You don't want to create something that makes you dependent upon some specialty item that you can only get and it costs a whole bunch of money. And then when you don't have it, what do you do? You cave. So I want wanted people and bees <laughs> to be able to survive and do well based on what's always just available. We don't necessarily have to boost them with some specific, unique thing. And uh, unless you identify a deficiency and it's going to fix the deficiency. But you have to think about the long game. So if you want to get it and try it, but let's say you bought it and it worked and it was fantastic. Wow, my bees are doing great. Don't do it to all your bees and all your hives at the same time because you'll have no comparisons. So you would select medium performers and then you would start them on the Super DFM. And then you would, of course, document their progress compared with other colonies. The more colonies you have, the more effective this assessment is going to be because it's statistical. And then you'll find out if they actually do perform better. And then you might find that it's worth, because I don't know how much that stuff costs, by the way. I'm sure somebody else can write that down or check the website. It's a dry, powdery substance. And uh, by the way, the inspensers, the dispensers and inspensers that are being made by Best for Bees haven't been shipped out yet. So I don't even have mine. And I supported their, um, their campaign, their fundraiser campaign, Indiegogo. So, and I think with the Indiegogo campaign, I actually put an order in for Super DFM just to try it out. But you have to weigh the balance on whether or not that's really going to pay off for you. And do you want to tie yourself to something that uh, you would have to continually use or maybe just certain times of the year you could use it boost your bees and then uh, that would be it genetics are the future of bees not going to talk about the military right now you know they can't even get qualified people in to do the jobs we used to do anyway they're trying to lower the standards because the new applicants in the military are not able to meet the minimum standard. I don't know how I feel about that. We need manning, but you don't want to lower the quality of the people that you have doing critical work. Moving on, question number four. This is Bob from Derby, Kansas. It says, I'm a first year beekeeper with two hives. My goal this first year was simply to get drawn comb for next year to help get a honey harvest and to hopefully get these two hives through the winter. Both hives are two deeps with two supers. That's a big hive. Two deeps, two supers. On the top of the deeps, one hive has the top deep and both supers full of honey. The other hive has the top deep 
full of honey, and about half of each of the two supers have honey. I was not planning on harvesting this year, no extractor, etc. Would it be okay to leave the supers on during winter? What would be the pros and cons to leaving them on? Okay, so Bob's question here goes right back to the first one that I was talking about. We don't have more resources than your bees are going to need through winter. Now, I know that instinctively, bees are hoarders. That is why they're bringing in more resources than they need. That's why this is a great part partnership between people and bees is because we take their surplus. We don't take everything they need. We take the surplus. And because they produce a surplus against hard times ahead, um, we also benefit from keeping the bees. So we get their honey. We get their extra wax. We get things like that. So, but here's what used to happen to me. I would have these super colonies. And by a super colony, I'm not talking about these 10 frame super giant columns of bee magnificence. I would have two deeps and two or three medium uh, supers on. And they would all be full. And I would think, now if I just leave those frames on there all through winter in the springtime, I'm gonna have this massive colony of bees, super healthy, and I'm going to be able to create splits out of those and make a whole bunch of other super healthy colonies. Well, it doesn't work that way. Let me explain what happened. Colonies that are large like that, uh, again, remember your numbers of bees are going to dwindle going into winter and through winter and start to build up again early next year. And then we think uh, they're going to rise, you know, because wherever they are right now, wherever the cluster is, and I spent a lot of time doing thermals and checking on where my cluster of bees existed. The worst case scenario, and it sounds counterintuitive, but it was really the worst case scenario, is that my cluster of bees was down low in the brood box, which is kind of where they all are now because honey is filling in every single available cell in the beehives. So what happens is here's the cluster of bees and up above them we have all this great extra honey. So if we've got two, let's say one medium super, let's say it has 47 pounds of honey in it, random numbers. So then we got two of those, okay? So we've got over 90 pounds of honey above your bees, and then we've got another box full of honey, and then the brood box based on this description. That's too much honey. Because what happens is, honey that doesn't have bees directly on it pretty much matches the outside temperature. Now when I do thermals, uh, I can see right where the cluster is, and let's say it's 27 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the thermal image through a normal three quarter inch piece of wood registers at about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're reading surface temperature. So the actual cluster temperature is not even being read. But then above them, we see these rapid gradients of temperature drop. And then so we get these dark blue areas. I know that doesn't mean anything, but the dark blue area, the, the cooler the color, the cooler the temperature was. And of course, oranges and yellows were the warms. Uh, so it would be really cold up there. Now, the day starts warming up. The hive boxes start warming up. And the cluster, of course, that distinction between the cluster and its surrounding air uh, kind of bleeds gradually into one another. So it's really vague. And of course, if it hit 60 degrees, for example, the cluster broke in there. It was a loose cluster. And then the whole area warmed up. But if you went out there in the early morning while the temperature is rising, guess what part stayed cold? In fact, stayed colder than the outside air. The honey way up above those bees was acting as a, they can act as a heat battery and a cold battery. So they hold the cold. Honey can be an insulator too, but what it really does is just slows down the transition of temperatures from, so warm things migrate to cool things. So when you had these blue frames hanging in there on my thermals, that meant that when the rest of the area was warming up, they stayed cool and the bee cluster down here was warm and where were they near the entrance, it's a warmer day, they're gonna utilize the entrance. It worked against the bees because I had the most condensation in that hive of any of my hives. A lot of condensation. So it formed on the surface of the surplus honey. And of course it would drip down, drip onto the cluster, and even the bottom board was wet. I don't mean damp, it was wet. So, and that's these transitional days. In other words, if it was really cold and it stayed cold, that was fine. And so it took me years to realize that, literally years to realize that how dumb I was, that because <laughs> I'd lose that big colony that I targeted as the one year after year, and they would just be 
wet, soaked, and dead in spring. Or so small and struggling that they were diseased. So that was, it works against them. So that's why we size the space for the number of bees that are inside your hive. So giving them a bunch of extra food is not always the best thing to do. So we want to pull those frames. We want to pull those supers. We don't want them to happen to, to have to occupy a space that is well beyond their numbers in order to occupy it. Because another thing that happened early on, probably like 2009, I opened one of those hives and it was a mystery to me because they had a lot of bees in there, but they had a bunch of honey, again, way up high, and they had uh, wax moths in the spring. And I set up cameras and I also went out there at night and you could see the wax moths flying around and wherever there was a gap in the wood or wherever the, the beehive had weathered and there was any kind of little opening, they would lay their eggs in there. So super annoying. Uh, so I had them shoot out with bees occupying it. Once again, they couldn't police it. They were taking care of themselves. It was still transitional as far as the time of year goes, climate temperature wise. So they still stayed clustered a lot, which means other pests and things like that could take advantage of the unpoliced areas inside the hive. So I really gave you an expanded explanation of why it's not good, even though it seems like it would be, to leave a whole bunch of extra honey. And then some people might think, well, what if we weren't there taking care of the bees and they were just in a tree somewhere and uh, we weren't removing the extra honey? Yes, thank you for bringing that up, whoever it is that has that question mark over their head. Uh, that's because in a tree, they're super insulated through the top. And so then what happens is there's passive warmth going up there. And so it's also a much smaller space. It, it is extremely rare to find a cavity in a tree that would be the equivalent of what's described here. Two deeps with two supers. That is a huge space. Very rare to find a tree that would even house that. So then we go all the way to the other side of the street with Dr. Thomas Seeley's Darwinian beekeeping, who says, you know, basically a, a deep and a medium, that's the limit. And then just let them swarm, you know, so you wouldn't get much honey, you know, so it depends on what your goals are in beekeeping, but you have to pack them down. You can have a lot of extra condensation in there if you live in the north at all in these big spaces. And even, by the way, if your bees migrate up the center, three or four frames, and they're moving up in the winter time, What's out here? Let's say you have a 10 frame high. This is also the thinking behind why some people go with eight frames instead of 10. This is also why, and I hate to throw a monkey wrench in it, but I'm leaning more towards the five over five over five. So I have these 15 deep frame five over five nucleus hives that do so well. And that's because now the cluster is really occupying four out of the five frames and they're moving up. So they don't have these first and second position frames and the nine and 10 position frames full of capped honey that the bees don't use because they stay there in the middle and they're going up. And now they've left behind capped honey, which there again gets cold, stays cold in the morning when the outside weather warms up, condensation forms on the surface of that capped honey. And now we have additional condensation and high humidity inside the hive. See what happens? So, so there again, the narrower, and I'm saying this just as I've gone to all 10 frame equipment out there for compatibility of everything, but by keeping those boxes down, insulated inner cover, and only having a couple boxes, maybe three max going into winter, now your bees can handle it and you're not gonna have those big condensation problems. Hope that all made sense. I think it's better to explain that stuff than to try to show it because when I'm showing these things, I don't get a lot of time to explain because we're trying to close up the bees. That's the other thing this time of year when it's cold outside and you know, when you're getting in your hives, try to make that as quick and efficient as possible. Learn what you need to learn, remove what you need to remove and get out of there. They need to be able to seal their stuff up with propolis. They need warmth to do it. Question number five, Randy from Mansfield, Ohio. When do you put the Hive Live fondant on in the fall, right after you pull supers, or do you wait until it's really cold? Okay, so pulling supers, by the way, needs to happen right now. If you're doing that, you should be doing it. Mansfield, Ohio included. So the fondant, and keep in mind, I just started this last year. I'm always plugging these guys. 
high volume fondant. You can make your own fondant, by the way. So there's lots of videos on how to do it, how to make it, how to boil it, how to not create HMF and all that other stuff, how not to poison your bees. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about the Hive Live Fondant Patties here, which by the way, I have two cases of them. So they're going on all of my hives this year too. When do you do it? So there's a, there's a method for that. You could put them on technically at any time, but I like to wait. And the way that you put it on plays in regarding when you're going to put it in place because some people take these and they cut off the whole front of it and they put it straight on the brood frames. I don't do that, but if you were doing that, then you would do that when you do your last packing down of your hive. So that's when that would go on. And the problem and why I don't do it, there are a number of reasons why I don't do that, but the number one reason is that in order to get back into this pack of fondant that's in this plastic thing, you want to leave it in this, by the way, uh, and not cut away the whole front because two things happen. One, it's exposed, so it dries out quicker and uh, the bees have to deal with it. If it starts oozing between the frames, they have to deal with it. So they may be consuming the fondant before they're supposed to. And then when you want to get in there to replace it, you have to pull off the inner cover and you have to access those frames again. So I'm against that movement as far as that method goes. If that's what you do and it's worked year after year, then you don't have the question. For me, because I know I talk about these all the time, but they work so well and I'm going to talk about it again because it's also going to illustrate what I'm doing. Your deep and your medium are below your inner cover. I always had the standard inner cover. I built these uh, feeder shims, they were called, and I thought I was a genius for coming up with that because they had integrated inner covers built into them. So there was a space underneath the feeder shim. Then there was a full inch thick inner cover with just a hole so I could put a rapid round on that. But of course that wasn't very insulated because a three quarter inch or a one inch piece of pine, for example, only has an R factor of 1.1 or 1.2 or something like that. And those feeder shims were working, by the way, but they had a space so I could pull the feeder shim off and you could have put fondant under that. But I leave the feeder shim in place and I want to put my fondant on top instead. And I'm repeating this, I know I've covered this before, but it bears repeating. So there again, cut the little circle on the label side of this. Center that circle over the top of this circle here. Then at any time in the winter, so whenever we get a 45 and a 45 degree day will seem super warm to us eventually. And so you look at that and because it's kind of a liquid material, it, it's slow moving. So when you put it on the board just like that, it contours itself to the surfaces. So it creates its own seal. So when I pull my outer cover off and I do use medium wooden supers or wooden feeder shims around this, I don't just put the cover directly on it because I don't want pressure directly on this. So this goes on after I've done the packing down when we get those first kinds of kind of frozen nights, assuming it's a colony, this is key, that already has plenty of honey on to get them through winter. So we're not talking about a colony that's struggling, that did not put on weight, that does not have the resources that they need. Because if you have one of those colonies, you're not gonna be putting this on yet. Instead, if you have a colony that's struggling, that doesn't put on weight, you're gonna to wanna to put on a wrap it around. I'm just using this little yellow one because it's easy to handle. I use the big white ones too. They are designed, they have a hole on the bottom that goes in line with this hole right here. This, by the way, it's teetering around. So you can also make, and I have them, a wooden piece, because this question comes up too. So some of these have a little extension on the bottom, like this one does, and you put that right on there and it teeters around. So if you're gonna put a syrup in there, that's a problem. So what do they do? You just take a center piece of pine, you cut an inch and three quarter or a two inch hole in it. You put that over the hole and you line it up just like that. You take this, which is going to have your heavy syrup in it, and you put that on top. Now it doesn't teeter around at all. And what goes in this when you're trying to get your colony, and this is the time to do it, by the way. Don't wait. This is two to one, and this is really hard to do. It is 16 pounds of dry sugar to one gallon of water. 
So you're really gonna have to heat up the water or it's never gonna dissolve. And when you put that in there, your bees can come up and feed on that and it helps them put on weight because that really dense sugar syrup like that, the bees are most likely to store that in the cells. You also can see very easily in the springtime which of your frames had that stored sugar in it, by the way, because it still looks white and kind of globby in the cells. So again, but that's an emergency for a colony that wasn't doing well. So let's assume they have the honey that they need and this is just your emergency feed. You put these on right on top and then, so as I said, any weather, you pull the outer cover off, you look inside and because the label is underneath of it, we can actually see the progress the bees are making. So we see two things. One, you'll see on these warmer days that the bees are up here and they're actually feeding. You'll also see some condensation form on the inside of this clear plastic material that it comes in, and they use that condensation to actually metabolize the fondant that's in here. So what's so special about this fondant over others? Well, it's made by Hive Alive. There is, we have to say, I have no scientific study that says that Hive Alive fondant is better than any other fondant. But of course they have the contents in here and uh, I kind of, you know, it says there's sucrose, dried seaweed meal, which is also part of their Hive Alive uh, liquid that they ask you to put into your syrup. That does have science backing it. I've seen no studies on Hive Alive fondant. So all I have is anecdotal information where I used this on half of my hives last year. Those hives did extremely well including struggling colonies, by the way, that I did not anticipate surviving winter. So this worked for them. Therefore, this year I'm putting it on all of them. Do I have a scientific study to back it up? No. So maybe it'll work just as well on your fondant because also to be fair, I've never put fondant on my hives until last winter. And what did I put on Hive Alive? Because it came from a company that's already making something that I use that does work, that uh, specifically deals with the nosema load when we talk about direct fed microbials and things like that. This also acts on the microbiome of the bees, which prevents them from having to feed parasites in the digestive system through winter. And those, just like the varroa destructor mites are concentrating on the fewer bees as we go into winter here, nosema is a problem for your bees in February and March. It concentrates in the bee gut because especially if we've had really cold weather, the bees can't fly out and do those cleansing flights. For those of you who are new and this is gonna be your first winter going in, the longer they're pent up inside, they do not defecate inside the hive. Therefore, they need warm enough days to fly out and defecate in the snow. And you'll also see that some of them, they held it for the last microsecond, they flew out and got it on the front of the hive and stuff like that. So you will see brown marks all over the place. Now here's the other thing. So insulated hives versus the uninsulated hives, the cleansing flights happened quicker and earlier for the uninsulated hives as compared to the insulated hives. So this year we're going into winter with, uh, and by insulated, I'm talking about the sidewalls not the top, not the inner cover, the sidewalls, insulated, uninsulated, more flights on the uninsulated on those warm up days earlier. So, and the, but the ultimate hive strength at the end of the year, did I really see an advantage? Nope, they all did well. So we can't say that either, it's just, it's comforting to us as human beings when we go outside on that super warm day when it's supposed to be like 39 degrees but the sun shines so it causes things to melt and it feels nice and you can get out there in your flannel shirt and just sit around and stare at bees. You see the ones that are flying, we know they're alive, you feel good. The insulated ones, no activity, we don't know what's going on. Can't even shoot a thermal image of an insulated hive from outside unless I'm just trying to shoot the entrance or something, very touch and go. I don't know where the cluster's located inside. This winter we're gonna be using the APMA hive as well. I know already I'm not gonna know where the cluster is because we have insulated sidewalls. Okay. So, do you wait until it really gets cold? No, when you do your pack down, you can go ahead and put it on because the bees are going to use what they need. Fondant. And I found out, you know what, last year I thought it was kind of going to be bad because I thought the fondant was going to get consumed right away because there appeared to be a cluster. Uh, 
right away. Like in other words, the cluster should have been down here with about 10 or 11 inches above them to the inner cover where the fondant would be. But instead the heat signature had them right up under the insulated inner cover. But then I had to realize that the heat signature directly under the inner cover could actually be a pocket of warm air because there's no venting, there's no upper entrance. So was it actually the cluster or was it warm air generated by the cluster, which expanded the heat signature and made them look like a much bigger cluster? I don't know, don't have the answer, but it worked. Question number six, Johnny Pendleton, Oregon. Curious to know, does OAV mite treatment also kill tracheal mites? Okay, that's a good question. What's OAV? Oxalic acid vaporization. Those are two, the oxalic acid vaporization works externally. Tracheal mites, by the way, invade and reproduce in your honeybee's trachea. And that is terrible. They occupy that. In fact, when we were doing our master beekeeping studies at Cornell, for those of you who don't know, yes, I'm a master beekeeper, which means I'm dedicated to learning so that I can teach you better. Master beekeepers are really educators about honeybees. But we went uh, into dissecting honeybees and looking for tracheomites. And you use a dissection microscope and everything else. But the reason I bring that up is the way they're situated in the bee uh, bees don't consume the oxalic acid uh, to a point where it would affect anything that's in the trachea. The trachea is, that's how they're respirating, by the way. So anything that's in there that impedes the bees' bodily function is going to work against the bees and can cause them to be sick. There can be sub-lethal indicators that your bee is negatively impacted by something. Unless we dissect them and look, we don't know. But uh, the way oxalic acid works on varroa destructor mites is it gets on the surface, gets on their feet, and impacts the mite, and the mite has to metabolize it. They're, the only treatment for trachea mites is getting the bees to ingest a medication. And uh, I will say right off the bat, there's nothing to support that uh, trachea mites are affected negatively by oxalic acid vaporization or the presence of oxalic acid at all. So you can look that up. I can put a link to that, but uh, no, it's just not. It's an easy question to answer. So if somebody is selling you OAV and saying it treats trachea mites, but my question would be, how do you know you have them? How do you know that your bees have that? Unless and just in our mind, we're thinking, but if I'm giving OAV, I'm also treating for trachea mites. And then you can relax on dissecting for trachea mites. Most bacteria beekeepers are not going to be doing the dissection. You're just not going to know. Uh, if you have somebody that has a dissection microscope and you want to look it up, it's a very easy procedure to do and it's very distinctive. You can see them clearly if they have them. And then you could look for current treatments. I'm not going to mention a treatment I almost did. Uh, the reason I don't is because by the time this video gets watched, maybe even years from now, I want people to actually look up treatment for tracheal mites. And then you'll see what's current and this way I won't be giving you outdated or incorrect information. Moving on to question number seven comes from Lynx MKIV. That's the YouTube channel name. It says, uh, in relation to cutting down robbing by not putting wet frames back in the hive for cleanup, what is the difference between that and a flow frame that you are not removing when harvesting and all that honey after closing off the tap as they say, drains back into the hive body for bees to clean up. Would you say that this is one of the flaws that flow frames have? It encourages robbing after harvesting frame or frames, since the whole design of these frames and hives encourages the operator to not remove flow frames from hives. Okay, so this is a, a valuable comment. And this also falls into what kind of flow hive do you have? Because if you have a flow super, that's different. If you have the flow hive original base, which I happen to have, I don't like it. But I'm going to use this to illustrate my point. This is the standard. In fact, this is the original flow hive base. See how it's angled? 
So it tilted back automatically. So when you put your flow hive on it, it was already in the harvest position. It had this raised edge up here. This was the entrance. It has a screen through the bottom and a removable core flute on the back. And there are two positions. So this is a closed winter position and this is the open position. Can you guess why I didn't like it? <laughs> because now if you did everything perfect, I mean, I'm sure most of us do do things absolutely perfect. Those beekeepers are everywhere. Uh, I make mistakes, so I've been out there all happy to have the flow hives and the bees did what they were supposed to do and they filled the flow supers and I posted videos about it. And uh, while I'm sitting out there with my jars watching the honey come out and go from the flow frames right through the elbows that I put together to keep the bees out of it. So there's a tube that comes out of the back of a flow hive and then that drains right into your jar. But for me, that was a problem because yellow jackets and honeybees come around and if they can get to that, depending on the time of year that you're harvesting. The last time I was out there, nobody cared. But if it's near the end of the cycle and there's foragers that are looking for stuff, their chances of discovering you back there are high. So I put lids on the quart jars that I use, or in my case, the half gallon jars that I use. Recap mason jar lids and then the tube goes down and bees can't get into it at all. So my problem was not all of the flow frames were capped completely with honey, with wax, I'm sorry. If they're not completely capped with wax, so that's the surface of all the frames, when you activate the flow mechanism, so here's the hexacells and they go like this and then the honey drains out and comes out a tube through the back. Some of the honey runs down the surface of the frames and drips into the hive and what's below the brood box and what's below that, the screen. And in this original one, what's below the screen, the core flute, and now where does the honey go? It runs across the surface of that, even if it's just like a half a cup or something. That honey starts to run to the edge of that core flute and it starts dripping out. The wasps discover it. Heaven forbid honeybees discover it. Now you got a robbing frenzy on your hands and you did kick off robbing on that colony of bees. So the key is to contain that honey inside that hive. And that's why if all you're using is a flow super, this is one of the things I'm going to remind people to do because I see people still do it. They, um, when you have a flow super on and here's the front of the hive, here's the back of the hive, you have to tip that entire hive two degrees backwards. If you don't, and most hives, because it's what we teach everybody to do, your hives tilt towards the landing board. When they tilt towards the landing board, first of all, that works against your flow super extraction process. So that's a problem. But if you left it tilted forward, any honey that drips down inside, and this includes when you're pulling boxes apart and you're ripping apart those cells between the frames and that honey drips down, it eventually finds its way out to the landing board. Now we've got a robbing frenzy. Same thing with a flow hive if you don't tip it back. This is why I don't like screen bottom boards for a lot of purposes, unless underneath the screen, there's a catch tray and that tray would absorb any drippings from whatever the hive activity is, whatever your hive configuration is, any drippings that go down inside that hive, if the bees can't keep up with it, uh, will end up in the tray, you control it, and outside bees cannot access that tray. If you have nothing but a screen bottom board on your hive and you have nothing underneath of that, which a lot of people do, some people swear by open bottom beehives, I don't, but if you had that, any manipulation of your hives up above, pulling of frames, accidentally cutting into a frame of honey, disturbing the cells that are between the inner cover and the top bars of your hives up on top or in between the boxes, that honey drips down, goes right through that screen bottom board, you got a robbing frenzy. So, solid bottom boards, tilted back, keep that honey inside, and guess who gets to reclaim it? The bees that are in that colony. Now the beauty too of the flow super and the flow hive itself, you're right, I don't take it off. Therefore, I have not opened the hive to the bees on top. And by to the bees, I mean those bees that are foraging, looking for opportunities to rob others. So because everything is completely contained, completely closed up, and even when I put the tube on, there's an elbow and it goes down in the jar, there is nothing open for passerbys to smell and rob. 
and that keeps the hornets and wasps and everything else away too. So it's actually much better because then when I close it back up and there's a little drippings inside that trough, there's a little weep hole at the bottom that the bees can now reclaim it. Now, if they can't reclaim it, if too much drips down, if I harvested a frame that wasn't completely covered or something like that, it goes into the tray. Guess what I have? When I'm all done, I pull that tray, I have a clean tray, I put it right in and I take that away too. The bees inside the hive can't go through the screen, can't access what's down in the tray. So I clean removable trays, whether it's an enclosed bottom board from another maker that has some kind of tray that removes, um, or if it's a flow hive, I always pull it out before I harvest, clean it, have a nice clean dry one in there. Why? Because if honey goes into that, I want to be able to reclaim that too. I want it. Or I want to feed it back to the bees or something, but not there. So when you have frames and surplus equipment that has been exposed to honey, that's been uncapped, that's been processed in some way, Please don't ever lean that against the hive it came from. Don't feed bees by setting it up for the bees to clean up on top of the hive. Any hive, any equipment that is next to or nearby a place where you put out wet honey surfaces is going to be the robbing spot after that resource has been exhausted. So feeding stations, if you have those, should be 100 or more feet away from your hive. And you want them as far, you know, nice and far away and use a consistent feeding station because guess what? Once you consistently provide things like that for them to clean up, uh, then the bees just routinely, so long as these foragers live, their memory will lead them back to check on that spot to see if there happens to be anything left out there for them to clean up. And that way they're not hunting and intensifying their search for resources at an actual hive. So actually the flow hive itself is much better because I don't have to pull it apart. I don't expose stuff to the foraging bees in the area. So that's the explanation. Uh, I use the flow hive twos and the two pluses now, and they have adjustable bases. And those bases have trays, everything's closed off. Bees cannot access the tray from outside or inside, and I can pull and change them. And anything that prevents your honey from dripping outside the hive is the right thing to use when you're going to extract or take apart your frames and boxes and packing down and stuff like that. So, good question. Question number eight. This comes from Eileen Anderson. That's the YouTube channel. Okay, so hey Fred, you mentioned using the B-Smart inner cover with the B-Max outer cover. Do you not like the B Smart outer cover? Okay, so I have B Smart outer covers. You don't see them out in my B yard. Uh, B Smart Designs wants you to buy what's called the Duo. In other words, if we look at the way this thing is made, so I'm going to pull this insulated inner cover back up. Was it was last winter my first winter with these? I think it was. Anyway, so. The way this is made, look at the contours on the, on the sides of it. See these ribs and everything? It looks weird when you set a wooden box on this because now this big white band is exposed and airflow goes through here, all the way around it. But this is the insulated part and this is the part that gets insulated. So B-Smart makes the ultimate hive cover that they want you to put directly on top of this. And I can explain why I don't use that. First of all, it's, well, it's contoured well. I mean, it's shaped right and it's shaped to partner with this. In fact, if you look at all these little divots in here, these are robbing screens that are removable. So this is all part of an integrated system. You're supposed to get the B-Smart outer cover. You're supposed to get the B-Smart inner cover. You're supposed to have the B-Smart ultimate bottom board which is where these little pieces clip into because these are mouse guards. This up here is a robbing screen. So all of these things, this is designed to store all of the things that you need. These are vent clips and we've already talked about, I don't do any venting, but these clips would clip on this edge and create a little air gap. So now you vent through the top. For those who live in super high humidity, high heat areas, and you have to have air movement through the top of your hive. Uh, so all of this stuff is designed to be here. So everything from B-Smart Designs is, is made to integrate. Now, 
I started using the B-Max covers because those are a heavy polystyrene cover, very stout. I've never worn one out. My chickens eat them if they get on the ground. Hate that. But uh, so the insulated cover works for me because the B-Smart cover does have an airspace in it, but it's not necessarily an insulated cover. Now, do you need an insulated cover above the insulated inner cover? At the time that that came out, I did because they didn't have this insulated inner cover to go with it. So today you could still use that because what I'm doing this year that's different from years before. I'm still using this, of course. By the way, these little spikes that stick down, they do not line up with flow high boxes because flow high boxes are weird and they're quarter inch narrower in width than other boxes. So I take a chisel and I chip these off. And that proved not to be a problem because now I can set this on an eight or 10 frame box. And the bees propolize along the edges and it holds its position really well. And then I put a feeder shim on here first, then the outer cover. And that's because I'm gonna be able to put fondant or a rapid round or whatever else I need. For example, in spring, your bees are starving, weather has warmed up and it's gonna warm up for good and this colony is way behind. Now in spring, you're going to put, you want the opportunity to make the decision whether to put a syrup on or to continue with fondant. So this becomes a very versatile space. How big a space does this need to be? Three inches is more than enough. And uh, so the B-Smart Designs Outer Cover, if you buy the Duo, uh, they're cheaper, so they're sold together. And it is white too. It sheds water. It's got a drip edge built into it. It does not have a meaningful R value to it, but now with the inner cover, maybe you don't need it. And because this year I'm going to be putting double bubble. So the double bubble insulation that gets really good uh, ratings if there's an airspace under it. So if I had a rapid round up here, the double bubble will be just barely larger than the inner dimensions here. So when I push it in, it holds itself in place and creates an airspace here that becomes an insulated airspace. So if I had double bubble in there, it wouldn't matter whether the outer cover were insulated or not. So I could use a metal telescoping cover, or I could use the B-Smart Ultimate Hive cover, which uh, is UV stable and everything else. And uh, so that would be something you don't have to paint, lightweight, it's grooved so you can strap it down. And uh, I only have like three of them. But now, if I'm using double bubble, this stuff, blah, 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 I could use, go back to the uh, Be Smart Outer Cover. So do I not like them? They just weren't practical for what I was doing before. They could be revisited now for what I'm doing as far as my configuration goes today. So there's that. So that's Eileen's question. Now that's, those are all the questions for today. We're in the fluff section. So, we get to talk about stuff and uh, getting bees out of supers comes up. So we have people, friends of mine, are harvesting their honey today. I can't believe that. 51 degrees. I would not be out there trying to harvest honey in 51 degrees. But if it's all the time you have, I realize that people have to do stuff. One of the things that comes up right away is how to get your bees out of those hives. Well, if we go back to a previous question, flow supers, you don't have to get the bees out. You don't even have to plan if it's hot outside. And by the way, I was concerned because the honey coming out of it was moving so fast that I thought it had a high water content. So I thought we were going to have trouble with it. But the truth of it was that was coming out at over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which was really interesting to me. Why would it be so hot in there? But anyway, it came out really fast and it was at 17.5% humidity. So it actually turned out to be really good. But uh, so that's one way. Harvesting with the flow supers is very easy. In fact, that's the biggest feature of the flow hive. You don't have to add smoke. That's going to be key in a minute. You don't have to open the hive. So the bees are going on about their business. You don't have to wear protective gear if you don't want. You just wear a, a veil or something. You sit back there with your cup of coffee and uh, you harvest honey up to a half a gallon per frame. So that put us back in the honey right away, just uh, sitting behind flow highs, flow supers. So that's a really easy way to harvest, but you don't have to get your bees out of those supers to do it. And you can put a flow super 
This is not just a Flow Hive advertisement, so don't misread that. But what I'm pointing out is that that is like the biggest gain of it is we don't have to pull hives apart. We don't have to smoke. We don't need protective equipment. We don't have to plan the removal of honey supers. Because let me tell you what else I do here. I do photography. So all this great uh, pollinator friendly landscape. Uh, you know, we have still have sunflowers. We still have cosmos. We have Maximilian sunflowers in full bloom. We have ironweed. We have Joe pie weed. We have all of these native plants around as well. So our environment is still great for pollination, but it's great for photography. And here's my problem because I keep these hives right near my house and right near that property. In fact, we have a big birthday party here tomorrow because my grandson turns seven. So do you think I could go out there right now and pull hives apart? Take honey today. Let's say today was the hottest day. Took honey today and then uh, let everybody come and just mill around and eat hot dogs and have a party and have a blow up house and all that stuff. No, because my bees, when I pull them apart and take their honey, they're not happy about it. They're not happy for a day or two. So those are the days that after you've taken all their honey away, they remember you, you come back and you're going to get stung just walking out there with your cup of coffee to see how things are going. So uh, time your removal of your honey around social activities. This is for backyard beekeepers. So often your bees are in a very close proximity. So I plan it. I like to give them a couple of days before I have a scheduled photo session or something going on before I take honey away. So after this party's over, you know, if, if it's 5, 5 o'clock, 4.30 or something, and everybody leaves and it's 75 degrees outside, yeah, go take the honey then. So, you got to get the bees out of your super. And so there are ways to do that. I see people using um, leaf blowers. I don't want to do that because there again, I got to be out there. I got to be around blowing bees out of your honey super. And I have a big DeWalt leaf blower. I got the one that blows the most air. Um, it's battery powered and it really kicks air and would definitely blow bees out of your super. If you want to tip your super up on in and blow them through, there's lots of videos on how to do that, but you're not going to come back in an hour and not be stung by angry bees that just got mistreated by you. It doesn't mean it's killing the bees, but it riles them up and they're not super happy about it. So let's skip over that. The next thing that I like to do, and this is something that's hard for some people. I like to use the skateboards. Got one right here. Do, 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 do. I'm gonna trash everything. This is an escape board. They have a lot of different designs. But to put this on, you have to lift up the honey super. So you're just serving the bees. You're gonna have to smoke them when you do it. Put the escape board underneath, put the board back on, and now I have to leave this for 24 hours if I really want them to get out of there. And it works really well like that. So in other words, I would plan today, but I'm just serving the hive twice. So not only do I get in there and uh, put the honey super on, and what if I have multiple honey supers? I can do two at once. On top of that, I put the skateboard all the way underneath. Don't waste your time if you think you're gonna use an escape board and there's brood up there. Keep in mind, I don't use queen excluders. So the potential for a couple of frames in there, especially near the center, a little arc of brood could be there. So I have to look at the frames. And I don't take frames that have brood in them. So the escape board, 24 hours, you're gonna lift things off and access the hive twice. So two days apart, we're harassing the bees, not saying that's terrible. You just have to plan ahead for that. Now you need two visits, 24 hours or more apart to get the honey off and then haul it back into the house. So, cover that, escape board, electric blower. The other thing is some people, and I don't know why they do it, a little smoke calms your bees. Because what do they do then? They start consuming honey, they think they're in for a fire, and they concentrate themselves around brood where the queen is and everything else, and they're trying to survive a fire. So some people think smoke, 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 keep smoking them like crazy until all the bees get out of their way. That is a terrible way to go, and here's why. Not just did you annoy the bees. You introduced huge amounts of smoke particulates into any uncapped honey and even the capped honey. Now you would think that if we had capped honey, 
How does the smoke, how does the soot get into the honey? What are you talking about? Well, because that honey goes through an uncapping machine. And if you've been smoking the voodoo out of your bees every time you look in on them, and you're puffing away like crazy because you're trying to get them out of a super, the number one foreign material found in honey when honey gets tested at facilities is from soot from smokers. So where is that completely absent? Flow supers, cleanest honey. So anyway, you want to limit your smoking. Don't use it. So don't use it as a method for getting the bees out of the honey super. Your bees, you can just tell they're, they're, you can listen to them. They ramp up their noise. Their activity level is ridiculous. They don't want to leave the honey. So you're doing it. So we get all the way down. What else do we have? Turkey feathers. Oh yeah. So this is what I used to do when I was brand new. Uh, pull the frames one by one, look at them. It's capped, ready to go. Shake the honey off. Not the honey. Shake the bees off. Put it straight into, I built my own, it was a tote, and I used those aluminum, or I'm sorry, they're carbon steel frames, galvanized frames that people use to build walls in basements and stuff like that. I used those metal studs inside a giant tote, and I screwed those to the walls of the tote, and I reinforced them so they would support honey frames. It worked really well. And I put that on the back of a cart, and then I would pull frames, shake them out, lift the lid, put the frame in there, close the lid, because that keeps bees out of it, right? So each time, frame by frame. Backyard beekeepers, we have a lot of time on our hands. We could do that. Look the frame over, no brood, shake it out, plenty of capped honey. You got some capped honey and uncapped honey on the same frame, should you harvest it? Well, let's tip it down and give it a quick shake and see if that honey just shakes out like water. If it doesn't shake out at all, hmm, pretty good chance. Keep in mind too, you're gonna to be blending this stuff. So the dry honey and the slightly damp honey is gonna to go together in your bucket later. So put that in your cart. Now then years later, they came out with, of course, the Hive Butler, which I mentioned a lot, but I'm gonna mention it again right now because tiny issue. So I like the Hive Butlers. They hold 10 frames deeps with space underneath. So you save the comb and everything. And they're very convenient. You put them in, you put the lid on, bees can't get in there. And uh, so anyway, the high butler totes work well for me because I can put, you know, 10 in each one, put that underneath the bench in my shop, leave it there until I'm ready to extract and nothing gets into them. And it's a good solid plastic that I can hose out, wash out later. My metal stud thing, the, uh, it worked really well, but if I didn't have it full of honey frames, then if they got cattywampus, they fell out of it. So another benefit to the hive butler tote system is that each frame has its kind of bracketed slot. They don't shift out of it. So getting your bees off and getting it under cover right away to prevent robbing from happening is the other move. So, but a lot of people, again, deep frames, it's some people physically have problems. Okay. So then we want to get them out of the super. What's another thing? So you can brush them off with feathers instead of shaking them, which my kids love to collect. Kids, my grandkids love to collect turkey feathers and they fight over who has the most feathers and things like that, blah, blah. But uh, so that's it. Now I'm gonna take you to what is my current favorite thing to do. So I've talked about this in the past, fume boards. All right, this is the metal backing of the fume board. This is a fume board. This is a really fuzzy material, and I don't use it anymore, even though I like using a spray that the bees don't like to get them out of the super because it works the fastest, much faster than a skateboard. I only have to put this on top and I can push the bees down. Works really good on a really hot day. Now you don't have a foam board, or a foam board. You don't have a fume board, right? So I'm gonna say you don't need one because I changed from that. I have them don't use them anymore. That's because, and I'm going to talk about which liquid I use, by the way. I use these cotton cloths. These are the cloths that you see, you know, bartenders are wiping the water spots off their glasses and stuff. And it's 100% cotton. It's a tight weave. These things are dirt cheap. They're about 50 cents a piece because you buy them in big packs and see the size of it. This is what I do. 
I take two of these. And I take a queen excluder. Remember, I don't use queen excluders, but I have a bunch of them on the rack. So let's say this is the side of the super that we're going to push the bees out of. I take these cloths off. I put them on top of the queen excluder. Just like this. See, it only covered most of it. Then I come over here and I put the other one on here. Put that on. Now I have cotton cloths covering this whole thing. This now goes into a standard telescoping cover, which you already have handy anyway. Maybe you could use your B-Smart Designs Ultimate cover, or you could use your B-Max cover. I prefer you set aside a cover just for this instead of buying a fume board. Then you put that on there, and now the underside of this looks like this. And this prevents the cloth, which is going to have your bee repellent. This prevents that cloth from being in direct contact with your bees, because now this goes inside your inner cover, outer cover, onto the hive without the inner cover. And then this pushes the bees out. Now here's the thing. Most people spray this. So I'm going to talk about what I'm spraying it with. This is called Honey Bee Gone. Spray all these cloths with it and uh, moves the bees out quick. So you stick around. You can, you can be right there five minutes. They'll be out of that. And then when you fold this all up, because it's got that spray on it, by the way, I highly recommend you wear nitrile gloves. When you do this, don't wear your bee gloves. And I take this, which is damp with the Honey Bee Gone, Put it right into a one gallon Ziploc baggie. In fact, rather than spraying that all over once it's spread out, like you would the foam, you know, the, the foam, the fume board, uh, you would take the fume board and you're spraying the fume board like that. I don't. I would have them in my gallon thing and I wet them in here. Let them get damp and then we close this up and then we store it for next time. And now that stuff stays damp, stays saturated. If you're not going to do it again until spring or something like that, that pack goes in your freezer. So why did I choose Honey Be Gone? There was stuff I used in the past called Dunoff. And the stuff has a strong smell. Some of the stuff that you can use uh, to get your bees out, you spray on your fume board. Never spray directly on the bees with this. You spray the cloth. In fact, it's best to spray the cloth Use these, put them on something like your queen excluder and use a standard cover for it. Close it off and the bees will move out. This smells kind of like almonds. This actually smells good to me. Yeah, it smells good. And this is by the Blythewood Bee Company. It's been a while since I've mentioned those guys. Those guys, I think it's one guy. Blythewood Bee Company, if you don't know, um, they're the ones that also make Swarm Commander. So the guy that owns the Blythewood Bee Company kind of has a background in formulating flavors and odors and things like that. I don't know completely what that is, but I'm going to give you a link down in the video description so you can go watch his video. And it was funny because I did watch the video before I talked about this today because I wanted to look it up, see what other people are talking about, see if there's anything bad to say. So I wanted to find out what the deal was and I found his video and he was hoping to get over a thousand subscribers. He has over 3000 subscribers now, but I hope you'll visit that, listen to that and see what's going on. Now, this is another thing when I was looking through my stuff, I found another beekeeper that probably a lot of you know, it's called Yappy the Bee Man. And because when I was watching the video by the Blythewood Bee Company, they also mentioned I've had this for a couple of years. They mentioned that Yappy the Bee Man used it to get the bees to do a forced abscond. That is very interesting to me because often bees show up in buildings, trees, places where we can't really pull things apart. A lot of beekeepers make their money doing extractions. People that come to mind would be Dirt Rooster, Randy McCaffrey, so we're talking about Jeff Horchoff, all these guys that do thousands of extractions, and Yappy the Bee Man also. And, uh, but he was able to spray 
honeybee gone, so if the cluster of bees was up here and there was a space below, they could spray honeybee gone in there and drive the bees and the queen and everything else right out of the space. To me, that's a perfect world because you don't have to damage the structure to do that. And then once all the bees are out, you've got the queen, you get them all to join that queen in a hive box or something like that, you can close it up. So something like that that would get them out is really good. So if you've got a favorite spray that you use in your fume board or if you use it to force an abscond, then uh, let me know. Put it down in the comment section. We'll look it over. So I hope that helps you out. Shout out today. Let me get a drink real quick. I want you to see an old timer in beekeeping that has been doing it for over 50 years. So he made notes on here. Oh yeah, not over 50 years. He's been doing it for 54 years. This guy's name is Roosevelt Robertson, and he's worked for the Bee Weaver family. But here's the funny part. I didn't find him on their YouTube channel. I found him on a YouTube channel called Encore Excursion and uh, 54 Years of Beekeeping. So I'll give you the link to that. That's my shout out for today. I hope you go to that. Watch this guy and listen to his story. <clears throat> you know what's making me cough right now? Honey be gone. It smells good, but it also makes you cough. I wouldn't. Don't put that stuff where you're breathing it. Anyway, so I hope you'll look at that and listen to a guy tell a story, his life story. How he picked his first job out of high school, what he did, what he learned, and what he does today. So that's it for today. And for those of you who don't like advertising, <clears throat> You should turn away now. Man, I breathe that stuff in. Boy, lesson learned. If that stuff is designed to push bees away, even though I said it smells good, almonds or whatever, keep that away from your face. Okay, this is my next coffee cup. This coffee cup, <clears throat> let me zoom in on it, has pollinators on different pollinator plants. And this is, again, one of the Teespring cups. And I took all these pictures right here on my property. And some of you are collecting those coffee cups, so I thank you for doing that. This is the latest one, and hopefully you'll like it. So that's on Teespring, and the link will also be down below. And if you want free shipping, it's Fred Ship. So I'm glad you were here with me today. Whew, the air is finally clearing. Watch out, you guys. I don't think... Any bee, honey be gone. It's people be gone too. Stay away from that stuff. Holy cow, be outside. In fact, I'm getting the thing out of here right away. But anyway, that'll be on Teespring for those of you who have collected it. My most popular coffee cup so far is <clears throat> bees all over a cup. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and that you can get out there and button up your bees for winter. For those of you who are in the Southern Hemisphere, congratulations. Looking forward to a really warm year. And I hope everything's going your way and that the Varroa Destructor Mite is suppressed in Australia. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm.